Victory, it is so good uh, to be with you. The last time I had the privilege of being here at Victory was all the way back in the, the BC days, you know, before COVID. And <laughs> a, a lot's changed since then. Is that not true? But can I tell you something that has stayed the same? Victory is an amazing church. And something else that has stayed the same is you have incredible pastors, incredible pastors. Despite all of the challenges that have taken place over the last several years and everything going on, we have watched your pastors lead fearlessly. They have demonstrated an extraordinary amount of grace and they have led with extraordinary wisdom. And I can just tell you from across the world, Pastor Paulo, uh, from the other side of the world, I want you to know that Jennifer and I and the American churches have profound respect and profound honor for you and the way that you've led. And I appreciate so much uh, you letting me stand here in your pulpit. Uh, as Pastor Paulo mentioned, I did play professional basketball, played in the NBA. I'm the guy that played with the guy. So you don't know who I am, but I played with some guys you might've heard of. I was a teammate with Michael Jordan. I was a teammate with Hall of Famer Ray Allen. I was a teammate and uh, um, tackling dummy for Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, and while you haven't heard of me, I did manage to make the most of my moments because I would always kind of be near the superstar. Every team photo, when everyone's looking for Michael Jordan or looking for Shaquille O'Neal, before they got to him, they'd see me right next to him with a big smile on my face. In fact, whenever we would play in Orlando, it was a time where the, 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 the team was great and we had Shaquille O'Neal and thousands of fans would wait outside after the game. And I would always make sure to walk out with Shaq. So we would walk out at the same time and thousands of people would be screaming and I could turn to him and be like, yeah, big fella, they love me, you know, right? <laughs> and just kind of take it on myself. But one game we were walking out after the game, Thousands of fans are screaming and the police are kind of holding everybody back. And one little boy kind of got past the police and came sprinting and stops right in front of Shaq and me. And it's not common for people to want to stop Shaq for the autograph, but he actually didn't stop in front of Shaq. He, he stopped in front of me. And he said, would you sign this? And it was that, that basketball card that you saw there. He handed me a basketball card with my picture on it. And so I took that and I signed it. Now I gave it back to him. But listen, I, I, I grew up collecting cards of all sorts, baseball, basketball, football, Pokemon, it didn't matter. I had cards of everything. And to me, to finally arrive on a basketball card was like the fulfillment of all of my wildest dreams. So I drove home probably illegally fast, and I came crashing through the door and told my wife, guess what? You're never gonna believe this. I'm on a basketball card. And she said, dinner's ready. And I'm like, no, I don't think you get it. Like all my life, I wanted to be on a card and I'm, I finally made it. I'm somebody. So the next day I headed off to practice and because my wife loves me dearly, she went down to the local card shop where you can buy athletic cards. And it's a block from our arena. So she goes walking in and she walks, of course, over because she thinks I'm one of the famous guys. So she walks like over to where the, the really expensive cards are, right? Of all time greats. And the man behind the counter said, oh, are you looking for something? She said, oh, I'm looking for a very special card. So he thinks, of course, he's gonna sell one of his famous ones and close early. And the man said, oh, well, what can I get you? She said, I'm looking for a Keith Tower card. And the guy said, who? <laughs> and she said, Keith Tower. And he said, what sport does he play? And she's like, bro, the big white guy that sits at the end of the bench for the Orlando Magic? Come on. So he goes, oh, let's see, big white guy that sits for the, at the end of the, and he goes under the counter. I'm not even in the counter. He goes under it and he pulls out like a, a broken down, crumpled up, wet, cardboard box and written in ballpoint pen on the side, it says five cents each. And he goes, yeah, he's probably in there. <laughs> so my wife goes through every card in this wet moldy box and finds 10 of me. It's the most popular guy in the box. 
She finds 10, so she lays them out, five cents each, 10, and she starts fumbling with her coins, and the guy says, you can just have those. <laughs> so I went from being worth five cents to zero. All of my life, all of my hopes, all my aspirations, everything I had sacrificed for was literally worth nothing. My friends, some of the things you're pursuing, even if you get them, they're worth nothing. So many of the things that keep us up at night, that occupy our faith and our prayer and our anxiety, even if we got them, they're literally worth nothing. I'm so excited to be kicking off a series for us today. As for me and my house, because at the end of this series, if, if it sinks in deep and you choose to build your life on it, if this is what starts to consume your prayer, if this is what motivates your faith, if this is the premise upon which you will build your life, not only is it not worth zero, my friends, this will change the world. We're gonna be in Genesis chapter 12 today. I'm gonna read Genesis 12, verses one through nine, and then we're gonna talk about it. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse one, goes like this. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred to your father and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the world shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set to go out to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak at Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Verse eight, from there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. I think one of the most common questions you get asked as a pastor is, Pastor, how can I be blessed? And then the, probably the second most common question you get is, Pastor, how, how can I be used by God to be a blessing to somebody else? And we see right here in this passage that of this ancient covenant given to a man named Abram, we see the answer to both of those. Look at this hinge verse, halfway through verse three, it says this, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How can I be blessed? Well, in you, not you, in Abram, God is speaking to Abram, it says, Abram, in you, all the families of the world, all of them shall be blessed which means if you are a family, you're blessed. If you're in a family, if you're part of a family, if you've come from a family, if you have a family, if you don't have a family, but you call this your spiritual family, you shall be blessed. Pastor, how can I be blessed? Oh, family, in some capacity, be it biological or spiritual, engage deeply and be family and you shall be blessed. But the text tells us more than that. It says, because Abram is blessed, you shall be blessed. And it said, when you're blessed, this is the other side of it. How can I also become a blessing? It says, you will be a blessing to the nations, which means the nations will be blessed because you are blessed, because God blessed this man, Abram. Let, let, let's take a look at how this works. Passage starts off in verse one. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country 
and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Go from your father's house. One of the biggest blessings is that each successive generation will go further than the last generation did. Just before Genesis chapter 12 starts, the last little bit of Genesis chapter 11 is where we first see the name of Abraham mentioned. Abram, Abraham, same thing. He's about to become Abraham. Work with me. All right. And, and it says this about Abram. It says, Abram's father, Terah, Terah took the family to Haran. Now, here's what that means. We all know, I hope, that, that Abraham was called on this incredible journey from his homeland, Ur of the Chaldeans. But before he left there and made it all the way up through the Fertile Crescent and down into the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel, before that happened, he didn't make the whole journey himself. Terah, his father, took the family, Abram, Lot, Sarah, and all their people, and he took them as far as Haran. 1,100 kilometers of the 2,400 kilometer journey, the father of Abram took. He got them to a certain point and he got them established there so that Abram could now take himself and his next generation the rest of the way. Sometimes we look and say, how can I change the world? Just start moving. I don't have what it takes. It doesn't matter if you have what it takes. Somebody coming after you can go all the way if you'll start the ball moving. Hope y'all are listening to what I'm saying this morning. Friends, follow God wholeheartedly for your leg of the journey and then set up the next generation with internal courage in their heart and the external resources that they need to start where you left off and go forward from there. They shouldn't have to go from Ur to Haran, next generation, Ur to Haran. You get to Haran, let them get to Canaan. Pastor Paulo mentioned we have two adult daughters. Jennifer, my wife, and I came to faith in Christ when we were 26 years old. My daughters are not yet that age. They're in their low 20s. But I had been a believer in Jesus for two years, two whole whopping years when we started having children, which means that my children were raised by somebody who was trying to figure out how to walk with God. And now in their low 20s, they're both serving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, involved in local churches. One of them's involved in a church plant. They're, they're, they've, they've figured out who they are in God and they're living it fully. And here's what's amazing. They, they got to that place when I had children when I was two years old in the Lord. They are gonna have children when they've been walking with God for 20, hopefully, or 30 years. So my grandchildren will be raised by an unbelievably deep, mature Christian, unlike my children were. So run your race, whatever bit you have, and put in your children the courage and around them the resources to go where you left off and run the next leg. And look at here in verse one, if you can put that back up. Look at this focus on following God. He said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show them. One of the reasons sometimes we can have difficulty like following God is because it costs something. He said, go from your father's house, from your kindred. Back then, your father's house was everything, man. It was your place of identity. It was your place of financial security. It was your place of like literal physical security, you stayed in your father's house until the father's house eventually became your house. But can I tell you to follow God, sometimes you gotta give stuff up. You gotta be willing to say no to certain things 
to get a hold of a God thing. And it can feel like, man, what a, like, what a sacrifice. But don't miss what's happening. He says, you're gonna, make, you're gonna give up some things in your father's house. But then he also says, you're gonna go to a house that I will show you. You may have to let go of some things to follow God and run your leg of the race. And what, but what you get in exchange for that is the God of heaven and earth showing you stuff. Letting you see things that you could not see any other way. Letting you actually experience life with the author of your very life. There, there's a, a famous penitentiary in the U.S. called Alcatraz. I don't know if you've heard it. It sits in San Francisco Bay. And its nickname is The Rock because it's, a, it's an island and it's just a rock. And then you got this big stone penitentiary that sits on top of it. And when I was playing basketball, we had come into San Francisco and we got invited to take a private tour of Alcatraz. It's no longer in use as a prison. So we have this private tour and we, they, they, they boated us out to Alcatraz and they gave us two options. You can either just sort of walk around and explore it on your own, or you can go with this guide. Well, I'm kind of a history buff, so I chose to go with the guide. It was about half, half the group went out on their own, half of us went with the guide. And as we're walking around with the guide, it was amazing. I knew we were taking the trip, so I had read some books, but to have this guy go, in this cell right here, this happened. Over here is where Al Capone got in a knife fight with another. I'm like, what? The great, you know, the legendary gangster Al Capone. And he's telling us about all these notorious criminals and walks us through this place. And I had such an unbelievably deep, like, insight and understanding. And when we gathered back up, it's kind of the, the group that had the tour guide and the other group, we sort of gathered back up. And I said to the other guys, I'm like, oh man, this was awesome. What'd you think? And they're like, eh. It was okay. I'm like, okay? Like, do you understand this place? Like, how incredible, how rich it was. And they're like, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's all the cells kind of look the same. And I'm like, no, didn't you see the cell over here where this happened? And didn't you see this place where Al Capone had a knife fight and they didn't see any of it because they were walking by themselves? I turned to my tour guide, who was an old man, and I said, man, sir, how did you get, like, how do you, how do you know all this? Like, how do you remember all the facts? And he said, oh, I was an inmate here for 20 years. <laughs> you can wander through life in a boring way, or you can leave everything behind and walk with the master tour guide who will show you things because he created it and he walked among men and he lived it. You can have a rich, meaningful experience. Okay, sure, you can't be in your father's house, but you can walk with a God that can show and explain and point and go, watch not just what happened here, but watch what is going to happen here. That's the God we can walk with, the God who will show us stuff. And by the way, in case you're wondering, this is the gospel right here. This is the gospel call to every one of us to leave life as we've known it and to follow a God who will show us how to live and show us how to love in a way that we have never before known. The text goes on in verse two and says this, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will, this is God speaking, make you. I will, God speaking, bless you. I will, God speaking, make you. Our job is to just follow God. His job is to make you into something. Your job is to follow him. His job is to make you into something. When we get this messed up and try to make ourselves into something, we lose. Because to make yourself into something, by definition, you've got to let go of God and grab hold of something else. 
And even if you become the best that you can make yourself, it is less than what God can make you when he's the one doing the crafting. One of our hindrances to really walking with God well as individuals and as families is we're trying to make ourselves or make our children into something. I don't know if it's a thing here in the Philippines, but man, in the US, I can't tell you how many families are not taking any time to walk with God because they're too busy pursuing their kids' per like dreams. Like, my kid is a prodigy. He's the greatest soccer player that's ever lived. And I'm like, he's four years old. Like, every four-year-old's a prodigy at something. Like, stop. How about you pursue God? You follow God. You instruct your children to follow God. Your family gets in a place where it would be blessed. And God is more than capable of taking care of making you into something. Now, this matters. It matters that you understand our job is to follow and God's job is to make because we have to get this ingrained because most of what God does in the journey is give us promises that are not yet, the, the reality of them is not yet mature. And if we're not careful, we can try to help God out in making his promises come to pass. This conversation is happening with a man named Abram. Abram is sent to a land of Canaan with his wife, Sarai. And Abram is told, you are gonna go to an incredibly fruitful land and you're gonna have a very fruitful wife and all kinds of children. He's promised a fruitful land and a fruitful wife and he goes to a barren land with a barren wife. In verse 10, which we didn't get to, he gets down to Canaan and there's a famine in the land. In a prior verse, Sarah is 75 years old and she's described as barren and it's gonna be 25 more years before she bears a child. We get promised something from God and if we just walk with him, he'll fulfill his promises. If we don't, if we try to make ourselves or bless ourselves. The two greatest problems that Abraham created for his own life was trying to deal with a barren land and a barren wife. Because as soon as there's a famine in the land, you might be familiar with the story, he books it down to Egypt. And then once he gets down in Egypt, he gets all kind of messed up and lies about who his wife is and creates a real problem for himself with Pharaoh. Because God brought him to a barren land with a promise of fruit, but a real promise of, I'll make you. You just follow. God's told he's going to have all kinds of, or Abram's told he's going to have all kinds of children and his wife is barren. And you might be familiar with the story. He goes and, you know, kind of does a thing with one of his wife's maidservants and creates a whole nother lineage and all kinds of problems. Rather than just saying, I'm going to follow and God, I'm going to trust you to make. It's when we try to make and things get a little bit messed up. And the reason God does it this way, if you look at that verse, is so that you will be a blessing. See, if I try to make myself into something, as opposed to let God make my, me into it, I'm left with the best that I can create, which is less than what God can create. And I'm left with less of his presence but if I pursue him, I have more of his presence and I actually become what he creates, which is better than what I could make. And that is an incredible place from which to be a blessing. All right, let's keep moving. Verse three, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I will bless those who bless you. I will, those who dishonor you, I will curse. Another big hindrance to us and our families walking well with God is praise and criticism. Those who bless you. And God says, I'll take care of those who bless you. I'll, I'll take care of those who praise you. So often when we're praised for living a certain way, it is human nature to do more of what is getting praised. 
And we live in such a way, we preach in such a way, we disciple in such a way, we make decisions in such a way, we post in such a way that people go, oh, bless your heart. And now we're more likely to want to do that behavior again. And it's so easy when God is calling us to do this way and the crowd is cheering us for going that way to start to veer off course toward this praise that just makes my heart feel so good. Or God is calling me to go this way, but this way is filled with critics, with criticism and judgment. Those who are not, those who are cursing you, those who are dishonoring you saying, what you're doing is wrong. And I'm more likely to be drawn toward praise off course, and I'm more likely to be drawn away from criticism. And sometimes the chart, the, the course that God charts for you has critics on it. And I'm more likely to go, ah, there's critics here and drift off to this side or to just stop altogether. And God is just saying simply, walk with me. I'll take care of both the praise and the criticism. I was playing uh, for the Chicago Bulls with against a guy in practice you may have heard of named Michael Jordan. And we're in practice one day and I get a rebound because that's what I do. I got a rebound, I passed it to my guard and as the big man, your job, it's not just because you're the slowest, although I am, it's your job to be the last one up the court. So I pass it to my guy, he starts flying up the court and I'm just kind of coming up behind it and the reason you're there is in case they steal it, you're back to kind of play defense, right? So our point guard starts flying up the court and right at half court, he gets the ball stolen from a guy sprinting right at me, a guy named Scottie Pippen. Now, if you don't know who Scottie Pippen is, you may have heard of Michael Jordan or go watch The Last Dance. You'll start to understand who these people are. Michael Jordan's the number one player on planet earth at that time. And number two was Scottie Pippen. So I'm running up the court and then all of a sudden, I have the second greatest player on planet earth coming straight at me. And I gotta tell you, when you're under pressure, it's amazing how quickly you can think. So I had this incredible thought as Scotty's coming at me. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna make a play on Scotty Pippen and they're gonna love me. The coaches are gonna think I'm the greatest ever. Have that split second thought. It quickly got interrupted because Scotty Pippen is running right at me and now filling the right lane is Michael Jordan. So I have this other amazing thought, don't get dunked on. Like, just, just don't embarrass yourself. And then I have this thought, please, for the love of God, don't hurt either one of them, right? I mean, I have, the entire franchise is coming at me. Don't hurt them. But I didn't want to get dunked on. I didn't want to look bad and get embarrassed. So I had this, again, rapid brainstorm. I'm going to jump out on Scottie Pippen, probably just a little bit too far. He's going to pass it to Michael and I'll turn around just a little bit too slow. And by the time I get down there, he's gonna already have dunked it. Nobody's gonna know any of the wiser. So I jump out on Scottie Pippen. Plan works great, he throws it to Michael. I turn just a little bit too slow so he can fly by. And I turn around and to my horror, Michael Jordan slows down. <laughs> because it's not enough for a player like that to just dunk it when he has a rookie there that he can humiliate. So Michael slows down and I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> we're doing this. <laughs> so I start coming down. I'm like, oh, this is so bad. And don't hurt him, don't hurt him. Try not to get dunked on, but more don't hurt him. So I come running down and I'm just about to go up like this. Michael comes flying in. He just, just starts to take off. And I'm like straight legged. I'm like in the least athletic position ever. I'm directly under the basket. I'm like, this is terrible. And just as he's taking off, he says, not so easy, rookie. I'm like, I don't, what, what, what? And he throws the ball and I turn around directly under the hoop. And I was so focused on Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan that I didn't see our power forward, a guy named Horace Grant, running directly behind Scottie Six foot nine, 260 pounds, an absolute animal. And I turn around directly under the basket. Michael, because it's not enough to just dunk on a rookie and make him look bad, let's hurt the rookie, throws the ball to, to Horace Grant. Horace takes off like this to dunk it. Whew. And he hit me, sorry, I still got PTSD, in the nose with his knee, like blast my face off dunks it. I go falling into the basket. I'm laying there, probably have a concussion. I don't know what day. And I'm kind of, 
And I'm laying there and I have this moment of like, all I wanted to do <laughs> was, okay, okay, no one's hurt except me, but, but at least you're not, right? We, I'm expendable. But all I wanted to do was avoid getting embarrassed. And here I sit gasping for air with blood trickling out of my nose, not knowing what day it is, completely immobilized, all because I didn't want to look bad. My friends, criticism and fear of it will paralyze you. It will keep you from moving forward. The moment of praise that I had with Scotty and the moment of dread, those leave you sitting there completely ineffective in the kingdom of God. Let God handle the praise. Let God handle the critics. You have one job. You and your family follow him. Hard. <laughs> Goes on in verse four. And says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed. I love this. He went as the Lord told him and he's 75. Why did he wait till he was 75 to go? Because the Lord hadn't told him. I think sometimes when we wanna serve God and do something amazing for him, we can get a little anxious and we wanna get ahead of him. This is particularly true for, for younger generations of, of leaders and you're raised, doing a great job, Victory, of raising great families and they just wanna run off and serve God. Don't go until God says. Wait until he's 75. Here's also something that's amazing. It's not just that he waited till he was 75. He went at 75. You know, when I envision 75, you know what I envision doing? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Sunshine, fishing pole. That's not true. I hope when I'm, a seven, when I'm 75, I'm as bold as as the founders of this church. I hope when I'm 75, I take new risks of faith, hand off what I've done and decide to serve God with whatever breath I have left in my lungs and whatever sight I have left in my eyes. God is not done with you. And when I watch the leaders of this church willing to raise up and hand things off and not hand it off and go, well, I'm done, hand it off and go, oh God, what is next? And take risks of faith. Parents, when you're leading your kids, don't ever let them see you compromising on taking risks of faith. Don't get comfortable. This man was 75 years old, laced, I know they lived a little bit longer, but he still laced up those sandals and got after it with Jesus. Love it. Verse five, I'm gonna speed things up just a little bit. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered in the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. Abram took Sarai, his wife. This might sound like kind of basic, <laughs> but I'm gonna say it because I watch it happening all over the place. As you're walking with God, take your family with you. Like husband and wife, it matters if you're going to be blessed and ultimately to be a blessing to the nations, it matters that you walk with God in unity like real closely. Like tonight, when you go home, talk about something that God may have sparked in your heart through this or come out to the marriage thing we're doing on Thursday night and see if God might wanna speak something to you collectively and talk about it and pray about it and gird your faith up and walk with God together in unity, husband and wife. He took Sarah with him. Now this matters because in our New Testament, in Ephesians chapter five, the scripture tells us that, that Christ and the church, you, not the institution, individual gathered followers of Jesus and the love of Christ, he said that is the picture in the earth, the picture of husband and wife, which means that every husband and wife picture is telling the rest of the world, is telling your neighbors and telling the nations about God's love for the church. 
So please let your marriage be telling the truth about God's love for the church. And it says that he also took Lot, which means take your kids. And if you don't have any kids, listen, take somebody from the next generation and walk with God with them. If you want to live in such a way that the world will be blessed by virtue of you existing, make sure that someone younger with you is on this journey with you. Verses six and seven says this, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. To your offspring, I will give this land. Can I ask you a question? What might God want to give to your offspring in the future through your obedience to him today? What might God want to give to your offspring in the future through your obedience today? I love this because God tells Abram, I'm gonna take you to see a land. And then he goes, to your offspring, I'm going to give the land. And by the way, it doesn't matter which generation you're in, God will walk with you in a way where you are going to get the fruit of a prior generation's obedience. At the same time, see the potential fruit for a future generation to receive. If you walk with God, there's something both you're receiving by way of inheritance because somebody obeyed and there's always something that God is showing you that you will not yet get. But if you'll obey in your generation, someone else will receive. So for the nations to be blessed through your family, it matters that your family both receives and walks obediently preparing the way. Let's finish with verse eight and nine. If I could have a keyboard, please, that'd be real nice. Verse eight and nine says this. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Look at this. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. He built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. As this series is getting started and for the next several weeks as you're being challenged in the way that you build your family and how your family can be a blessing to the nations of the world, I want you today, I wanna start with us building an altar right here. And I want you throughout this series to be calling on the name of the Lord. Because for some of you, you're the first people that have even considered that God's real and started a journey with him. Oh man. A generation is gonna rise up and be blessed by virtue of you in one moment calling on his name. Some of you come from a rich heritage of walking with God and your parents walk with God and your grandparents walk with God. And sometimes in that, it can just sort of be what we do. And if we'll build an altar to the Lord in a moment where we will meet with him and not just say, hey, how do I be sort of the end user of this and be a nice guy? But God, what would you have from my generation? What, what step of obedience would you have for us? God, we're calling on your name, not just what our parents did, not just what our grandparents did, but the name of the God most high. Can we take a moment right now, wherever you find yourself on this journey with Jesus, and let's build an altar right here. And let's call on his name. God of heaven and earth, I'm asking you, sir, for these great sons and daughters who you have called your own, who you are desiring to bless in a way that would blow their minds. 
so that, oh God, they'd be rich and overflowing and literally the nations of the earth would be blessed. God, even now is there calling upon your name, sir. I pray that some, God, you would encourage because it's been a tough stretch. God, I pray some you'd provoke for they've rested too easy. God, some just need fresh revelation of the land to which you're calling them. And God, courage to say no to the former ways. We call upon your name, O oh God. And God, in this moment, I ask that each of your precious sons and daughters here, that it would be said of them, just as it's said of Abram, that they would journey on. You're not done with any of them. You're not tired of any of them. You're not over any of them. May the men and women of victory journey on. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Thank you, Pastor Keith. Um, before we wrap our time here, I want to call, I pray for a couple of groups of people today. Some of you, God's calling you to get out of your comfort zones. And there might be things that God's calling you to do and he's calling you to obey. Bow your heads with me. And, and some of you, it's a decision you're going to have to make in the coming days. And it's going to spell the difference for you and the future generations. And it starts now with that decision in your heart. It's, it's going to change the, the trajectory of things to come as you make that decision. And you know it's the right thing. But you're asking God, Lord, give me courage. Lord, I pray for grace to be able to make that decision. If that's you, lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Even those of you who are online, pray with us. Those of us, Lord, who are lifting up our hands and asking you for grace to be able to make this decision. Thank you, Lord, that there's going to be grace. And it's going to be more than sufficient. Because, Lord, this decision is not for us. Not for anybody else, but really for you, for your glory. In the name of the Lord, we lift this up to you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we make this decision. Because, Lord, we know it's not just going to be for us, but it's going to be for the future generations. Thank you, Lord. Put your hands down. One more thing I want to pray as we end. That all of us, God's called us to a life that will follow him. And as we do, and as we make that decision, people around us will actually see it. And we're going to be a shining light and we will be a blessing to the people. And so I want to pray as we end. We lift up our hands, all of us. Lord, we lift up our hands to you. Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways. Lord, the greatest blessing is our salvation. Lord, every single one of us here who have been saved, brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, Lord, we are saved because of the blood of Jesus. And it is through that sacrifice we stand pure and holy. And Lord, because of that, Lord, we want others to be able to hear that beautiful message of the love of God. So Lord, I pray that the generations after us and the people around us, Lord, will hear that message and be blessed because of that very thing that you've done for us. And so, Lord, we pray as we leave this place, let it be that your righteousness, your peace, and your joy go with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Again, thank you, Pastor Keith, for preaching the word. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, if you need prayers, our pastors and leaders will be here in the front. Um, those of you who are parents, don't forget your children. And they're downstairs. They're still eating their pizza.